a part I would like to read to you this morning. Uh, this is from one of the families that received a Thanksgiving basket. Um, it says, hello, I would like to take this time to thank you for the gift basket of food. We were able to have a great Thanksgiving because of your generosity. Also, thank you for the uh, food from your pantry. I cannot thank you enough. And then it's signed. Um, a lot of times we see the, the, the work and the process of, of reaching out, but a lot of times we don't really see the impact. I, I wanted you guys to be aware of this because we're not doing this to no avail. Okay? We're, we are having an impact. We're reaching out into the community. So I wanted you guys to be aware. Um, people are noticing. People are appreciative. If you have your Bibles, uh, open with me to Leviticus uh, chapter 23. <clears throat> we have been working through the feasts and uh, Leviticus chapter 23 lays them out as a directive to the people of Israel. Um, we have covered the feast thus far. We've covered the celebration of Sabbath. Understanding that Christ has come, that we can celebrate Sabbath any day we choose, and that there is a, a Sabbath rest coming for God's people. We looked at these scriptures and, and we understood that one of the key concepts here is to remember. God put these feasts, these celebrations, these memorial days into effect that the people of Israel might remember. Remember what God had done. Remember what God had promised. And remember what God was going to do. Now unfortunately, just as we often do, we, we, the Jews got caught and only looking one direction. They only looked backwards. They, they looked to what God had already done. And yet we see that each of these feasts is representing a prophecy, a, a divine utterance of what God's plan is. Not just what He did in, in, in making Israel a nation and delivering them out of captivity, but, but what God's plan is for all of humanity in delivering us from sin to pay the Redeemer's price. So <clears throat> we looked at the Sabbath. We looked at the Passover. Um, I would encourage you, if you have never been to uh, our Seder dinner, I would really encourage you this spring, sign up, come. Um, we look at the traditional Seder uh, that the Jews have been practicing since about the 5th century A.D., and, and those traditions are built on traditions that extend way back. And we see, we, in our Seder, we show you how God has woven into this, this, this feast the prophecy of His Son's coming and His Son becoming the Paschal Lamb, the, the perfect sacrifice. Right on the heels of that, we go into the Feast of Unleavened Bread, we talked a little bit about the concern, uh, the, 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 how the Pharisees interpreted the passages versus how the Sadducees interpreted the passages. Uh, that difference is going to come into effect in today's feast. We'll talk a little bit more about that when we get there. But um, the Feast of Unleavened Bread, leavened throughout Scripture in almost, almost every case, refers to sin and how when sin comes in, it works through the whole batch. It corrupts the whole thing. Once, once yeast is in, once the leaven agent is in, you can't separate it back out. It takes God to do that. And we see that when Jesus went to the cross as our, our perfect lamb, He went spotless with no blemish found in Him. He was perfect. Well, in the midst of this, we have our next feast. And this is called the, the Feast of First Fruits. Um, I, I've done this a little bit different today. Um, hopefully it will make it easier on you. Uh, we'll kind of see going forward if I'm going to do this each time. 
But uh, if you would go ahead and put the first slide up. Uh, I'm, I'm, I've made some slides so you can kind of see as I'm going along. I, I don't know about you guys. Some people are, are uh, auditory learners. They learn by hearing. Some people are visual learners. They learn by seeing. Other people are experiential learners. They learn by experience. Um, I'm a visual learner. If I see it, it's mine. I, I, I can just hold on to it. Um, my wife can attest, I am not an audible learner. That's why I have to ask her multiple times throughout the day, what are we doing? Before we go to bed, I ask her the plan for tomorrow, at least twice. When I get up in the morning, I ask her, what is the plan for today? She used to say, we talked about this last night, and I would tell her, yeah, I'm just checking to make sure it's the same. <coughs> and then we get in the car. And if I'm not paying attention, I'll get down to the highway. I'll turn the wrong way. I got a 50-50 shot. I can go right or left. But that means I got a 50-50 chance of failing. And I'll start to turn and she'll go, didn't you want to go to Stevensville? I did. <laughs> Momentarily. What's the rush? <laughs> I thought we'd take a nice drive today. I'm not an auditory learner. I'm a visual learner. Um, <clears throat> so, the Feast of First Fruits, there are two passages that deal with this specifically. We're going to take a look at both of them. I'm just going to read through them, and then we're going to move forward. So, the first one is Leviticus chapter 23. You should be there. Um, we're going to pick up in verse 9. And the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to the people of Israel and say to them, When you come into the land that I give you and reap its harvest, you shall bring the sheep of the first fruits of your harvest to the priest. Now, does everybody have sheep there? Does, does anybody have a different word besides sheep? Bundle. Bundle. Okay. Anybody have anything different? Okay. Sheep, sheep and bundle. We'll come back to this in a minute. Uh, verse 11. And he shall wave the sheep before the Lord, so that you may be accepted. On the day after the Sabbath, the priest shall wave it. And on the day when you wave the sheep, you shall offer a male lamb, a year old without blemish, as a burnt offering to the Lord. And the grain offering uh, with it shall be two tenths of an ephah, a fine flour, mixed with oil, a food offering to the Lord with a pleasing aroma. And the drink offering with it shall be of wine, a fourth of a hen. And you shall eat neither bread nor grain parched or fresh until the same day. Until you have brought your offering, uh, the offering of your God, it is a statute forever throughout your generations uh, in all your dwellings. Okay? So here we see that. Whoa! Good Lord. Hello. You know, that's the first time that's ever happened. Usually I see him coming and it doesn't scare me. <laughs> Flip over to Numbers chapter 28. <clears throat> We're going to pick up in verse 24. Actually up there it says 26, but I'm backing up to 24. No, I'm not. <coughs> My glasses are not right. 26. That was right. I was wrong. I love it when I'm right. <laughs> it's happened so rarely. 26. On the day of the first fruits, when you offer a grain offering of new grain to the Lord at your feast of weeks, you shall have a holy convocation. You shall not do any ordinary work, but offer a burnt offering with a pleasing aroma to the Lord, Two bulls from the herd, one ram, seven male lambs a year old, also their grain offering, a fine, uh, the grain offering of fine flour mixed with oil, two tenths of an ephah for each bull, two tenths for one ram, a tenth for each of the seven lambs, with one male goat to make atonement for you. Besides the regular burnt offering and its grain offering, you shall offer them and the drink offering. See that they are without blemish. Okay, so Numbers really is just going into a bit more detail of what we already discussed 
in um, Leviticus. So um, go ahead and go to the next page. There are four names by which this feast is known. Okay, uh, the first one is Ha Habikurim, which means the feast of first fruits. That's why we call it first fruits. Okay. Uh, the second one, I'm, I'm going to butcher the Hebrew right now. I'm just letting you know in advance. For those of you Hebrew scholars out there, have mercy on me. Okay? The second one, uh, Reshit Ketzer Shem, Chem, Chem. It's the feast of your harvest. Okay? The third one, which is very similar to the first one, Yom Habikurim, the day of first fruits. And then the fourth one, I'm not even going to try. It's the counting of the Omer. I was asking because in, in some of the different translations, instead of saying sheep, it says Omer. Okay? Omer is a measurement. We'll, we'll kind of touch on that in a little bit. But these are the four names that this feast goes by. And there's actually a fifth that is kind of tucked in there. Uh, we just read the passage when it, it talks about the Feast of Weeks. And, and there's this bridge of time from the first fruits. And then you count off 49 days, and on the, the 50th day, you have uh, the Feast of uh, Pentecost. Okay, so there's, it's kind of the start, and it goes through Pentecost. Now, the Feast of First Fruits is called the Feast of First Fruits because it's the first fruits gathered of the year. Now, if you remember our, our Hebrew calendar, uh, we started off with the month of Aviv. Or, or later the name was changed to Nisan, um, we're still there. Okay? If you remember on the 10th of Nisan was Lamb Selection Day when the lambs were brought into Jerusalem to check them to see if they were without blemish. And then uh, on the 14th, uh, they would begin the Passover celebration by sacrificing the lambs for the individual families. On the 15th, they would sacrifice the lamb for the nation. And, and that would start the Feast of Unleavened Bread. Well, we have specific dates for each of those. And even with those specific dates, we have disagreement and discussion. But before we get into that, there are a, a number of things that I want to draw out of these two passages that we need to note that God says are significant in the celebration of the Feast of First Fruits. So number one, it was a one-day celebration. One day celebration, it was a holy convocation. What is our definition of a holy congregation, uh, convocation? A gathering. a gathering. A gathering of those that are separated out. Okay, that's us. This, is, this would be considered a holy convocation. But there were some rules that went along with the holy convocation. And, and essentially what it meant is that you did no ordinary work. Okay? You had to prepare the day before so that you didn't have to take care of stuff on the day of the Holy Convocation. So the first thing we need to know, this is a one-day celebration that is a Holy Convocation and there is to be no ordinary work. Okay, second thing that we need to know. Um, this marked the beginning of the gathering of the first fruits. In, in early spring, this was typically, this was barley. That, that harvest would come due first. Uh, we're going to see that there's going to be a, a feast of the latter fruits. We'll talk about that later. But this was the beginning of the harvest season. Okay? So, uh, number three. The offering of the harvest was to be one omer. Okay? That was the equivalent today of about nine cups. I think technically it's like 9.3. But for our purposes, it's nine cups. Okay, uh, let's go to the next one. Um, this was to be celebrated on the day after the Passover. The, now, this is where things get a little tricky. Okay, because in Leviticus 23, it says that it will be on the day after the Sabbath. Well, the problem arose as to... What's Sabbath? Because, you know, our definition of, of Sabbath is simply that it's an intermission. It, it's a break. It's a pause. You're, you're stopping for a moment 
so that all of your attention can be given to whatever that day is about. God has mandated for man, I believe this is because by design, that we work six days and then we have a pause, we have an intermission. We rest. Okay? We rest because God rested, not because He was tired. Okay? He didn't get tired. He modeled for us what is proper for the way we've been designed to have a, have a rest. Now, we see in the first couple of verses of chapter 23 in Leviticus that there were, they were to take one day a week to have a Sabbath rest. And that would be Saturday. It would start evening Friday, sundown Friday, and it would go to sundown Saturday. One of the things you have to keep in mind as we go through this, okay, is that the Jews count the day according to the, the uh, records in Genesis, that the day begins at sundown. And it goes all the way through the night, and then through the day of the next day, and it ends at sundown the following day. We don't do that. We start at midnight, and we go to midnight. Uh, they did it from sundown to sundown. This is going to be significant in how we start counting things, because as God brought stuff to their attention, uh, they, they have a very different calendar system than we do. Okay, people in our, our calendar system, we've got to have a leap day every four years to get everything lined up right. Okay, because every year, technically, we don't have 365 days. We have 365 and a quarter days. Okay, the Jews didn't do that. They used a a lunar calendar that moved on a 30-day, 28-day period. And, and as a result, in order to keep the feasts where God commanded them to give the feasts, they had to periodically stick an entire month in the calendar. Okay? So, you think you had a tough with leap year day? They had an entire month that would be just like, boom, here it is. Okay? So, keep this in mind. Going to the next one. This feast was to acknowledge God's provision. Now, it's interesting because God told them that they were to bring the food in at the start, not at the completion. Okay? God didn't tell them, after you've harvested everything and you've got it all and you're secure, then you can bring me something. He said, no, at the beginning. Bring it to me. The first is God's. Okay? The first is God's. Now, technically... It's all God's, right? We understand that principle, right? Everything in creation is His. But He has required of them and of us that the first would be given to Him. Okay? So, this is a principle of faith and obedience. You bring to me the first of the first fruits. As a matter of fact, we read in, in Leviticus that, that they were not even to eat of it until it had been given to God first. Okay, so uh, go on to the next one. Uh, the feast was to mark the two months of the springtime harvest. Uh, we touched on that briefly already. Um, it, it starts with the barley and it'll go through and it'll end at Pentecost. Uh, that's not the end of their growing season. They will actually have a, another one later. We'll, we'll touch that later. But this marks the beginning of the harvest. Go ahead and go to number seven. Now, an offering was to be given. Okay, We read a little bit about this in Leviticus and more later on. Um, <coughs> excuse me. Two bulls, one ram, seven one-year-old male lambs, and one male goat. There was a grain offering of the fine flour mixed with oil. And, and actually one that I, I neglected to put up there is there was also the hen of wine. Okay, all of these things are to be brought as a sacrifice on this day. This is over and above the normal daily sacrifice. Okay, um, I don't know about you guys, but the idea of, of the the fat the, the fat and the stuff laid on the altar and cooked, and then the flour thrown on and, and the wine thrown on. Um, God calls that a pleasing aroma. I don't think it has anything to do with the smell. I, I think it has to do with the, the heart. 
the, the person that's giving the offering. Uh, because we see later in the prophets, at one point God even tells the, the prophet, close the door to the temple because your offerings mean nothing to me. Well, it's the same offering. They're bringing the same stuff. They're putting it in the same place. They're going through the same process. See, I don't think it's the aroma that God is pleased with, the smell of, the, of what's on the offering. I think it's, it's the, the heart that is being lifted up to Him out of obedience, out of love, out of adoration. I think that's what's pleasing to God. Okay? So, we see these things that are all drawn together to make um, the celebration of first fruits. Now, this, this is what Scripture says. That's it. Okay? That's, that's all that it says. Now, the Jews being the Jews, and being a lot like we are, okay, they, they added to this celebration. And I'm going to kind of read through how they celebrated this. Now, this, this period of time, we know this was what the, the, was done from the second temple, about 515 B.C., up to 70 A.D. This is, this is the, the kind of the plan that they would go through to set this up. Um, <clears throat> I have to read this because it was, was pretty fascinating. So what happened in 70 A.D. to stop this? Did anybody know? Destruction of Jerusalem. Destruction of Jerusalem. The temple was destroyed. Okay, so here's the process that they would go through. Uh, there would be a delegation that the Sanhedrin would appoint. They would go to a field and they would mark off a section of the field. Okay, this was done the day before the feast. They would go out, they'd look at the field and they'd mark off a section of it. Okay, the next day, there would be three men that would go and present themselves at the field. They would carry a sickle and a basket. And they would go to the field, and then the people that would gather around, the bystanders, they would ask five questions. Um, the first thing that, that you had to note was this was done at sundown. Okay, so this is the start of first fruits. So the first question was, has the sun gone down? Yeah, duh. This is the process. Okay. Second question, with this sickle, Third question, into the basket? Fourth question, on the Sabbath? And the fifth question, shall I reap? When all of the questions were responded to in the affirmative, when, when each question received a yes, they would then harvest an ephah of grain. They go, a what? An ephah is about... 10 omers. So if an omer is 9 cups, and there's 10 of them, then an ephah would be about 90. It's actually at 93 cups. Okay? So they would harvest that much grain. They'd put it into the basket. They would then take it to the temple. They would winnow it. They'd get rid of the, 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 all the stuff that they didn't need. They would take the grain. They would put it in pans with holes in the bottom and they roast it over the fire so that the grain would actually be touched through the holes by the fire. They would then uh, clean it up and grind it. They would take the flour that was made out of this and they would take that and the priest would take one section of that flour, one omer, that would be given as the offering. The other nine tenths of that, that flour were given to the priest and his family to eat. Okay? This was one of the things that God instituted so that the people that were working on his behalf were taken care of. So they would take one-tenth and offer it, and nine-tenths would go to the priesthood. All right? Now, how, how a lot of this fits in with what God required of them, I don't know. Why they had to ask those five questions, I don't know. But we, that's just what we know that they did. Um, so in, uh, does anybody know what day of the month, what month that the temple was destroyed? The ninth of Av. 
the temple was destroyed by the general Titus. He tore down the walls of Jerusalem. He threw down the walls of the temple. And all sacrifice ceased. Remember when God uh, set up uh, the tabernacle at Shiloh and then later at the temple on, on uh, the mountain, he said that you shall not offer sacrifices anywhere but here. Bring your sacrifices to me and this is where you make them. I don't want you going up to every hilltop. I don't want you going out in the valleys. I want you to bring your sacrifice here. Okay. Now this obviously has presented a, a great difficulty for the Jews. Because without the temple, they can't make the sacrifices. For Jews that have not received the sacrifice of Jesus Christ, they have no way to make an offering for atonement. They have no way that their sins can be covered over. You wonder why the Jews want the temple back? Because if they're believers in the Word of God, in the Hebrew Bible, without that temple, they will never be forgiven. Okay? As relates to first fruits, the offerings couldn't be made. The, the grain offering, the wine offering, the, the different animals, they couldn't be offered. So, for all intents and purposes, from 70 A.D. to 1948, um, there was, no, there was no first fruits. And then from 1948 to now, they still can't do it the way that God has ordained it, so they, they've made some changes. Now, in Israel, the farmings, the, they're called kibbutzes. Okay? And, and it's actually a communal group, and they will work together. And while we were in Israel, the gentleman that was our tour guide was telling us that each kibbutz specializes in different things. Now, each kibbutz is responsible for farming, but the kibbutz that he belonged to actually built tractor parts that they sold all over the world. Um, but they, they were responsible for taking care of the farm and then they had these other jobs. So um, on the, the day for the, the Feast of First Fruits, um, they would go out to the, the field and they would harvest it. And they do this today. They, the men will cut it down with the sickles. The women will come behind and they'll gather it up and they'll tie it. They'll put it on carts that are uh, decorated with, with flowers and ribbons. Um, when the, the field is harvested, they will dance in the field and they'll celebrate. And then as the sun goes down, they'll take the cart, they'll take the harvest, they'll go back to the communal uh, dining room. It's an amazing thing. We, we actually got to eat at one of the communal dining rooms. It's a cafeteria. I mean, and it's huge because everybody that's in the, the community eats there. And, and they clear everything out and they put the harvest in the middle of the floor. And they sing songs of praise and thanksgiving because of what God has provided for them. That's how they celebrate first fruits today. It's, it's a far cry from what God had ordained and what is possible today. But I believe that's a sweet scent to God, that aroma, because their hearts are giving Him thanks for what He's provided for them. Okay? So... Okay, we've got a couple of problems here that we need to address. Uh, the first one, does anybody remember what day this was supposed to take place on? day after the Sabbath. The day after the Sabbath. What's the Sabbath? Saturday. Well, Saturday was given as the Sabbath weekly. And it was to be set aside as a holy convocation, and they were to do no ordinary work, right? But in the midst of this, we have the Passover, which is supposed to be a holy convocation. And then we have the first day of the Feast of Unleavened Bread, which is also supposed to be a holy convocation. And then seven days later, at the end of the Feast of Unleavened Bread, another holy convocation. Now these were set according to the calendar. They were a particular day of the month. Thus, they could be a different day from year to year of the week. So this year it might be Tuesday. Next year it might be Wednesday. Or however it works. So when you have a holy convocation, you might end up having three Sabbaths. Sabbath thigh? Sabbath thigh. What would be the plural of that? Sabbaths. 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 
You could have three Sabbaths in a row. Passover on Thursday, Feast of Unleavened Bread on Friday, weekly Sabbath on Saturday. Okay? So the dilemma comes in, which day after the Sabbath, which Sabbath is it? Because if we go on the Passover Sabbath, then it's the, the next day immediately, which is also the, day, the first day of unleavened bread. Well, the Pharisees said, well, obviously, it's the day after the Passover because the Passover is what's called a high Sabbath. Okay? So, they said, we will do this on the day after, so it would be on the 15th of Abi. Well, the Sadducees, they, they looked at the Scriptures and they said, well, no, it doesn't say the high Sabbath. It doesn't specify the Passover. It doesn't specify the first day of the the." the unleavened bread, it says the Sabbath. Well, there's only one Sabbath that we celebrate weekly, and that's on Saturday. So, for the, the Sadducees, they went with the strictly literal interpretation of the Bible, and they said it will be on Sunday. Now, we will have Passover, whatever day Passover is, we have to go from that day to the next Sabbath, and then the day after that, on Sunday, that's when we celebrate the Feast of First Fruits. Okay? Now, this is, you have to understand the difference that are being played out here. Because the majority of the New Testament writings were written from the perspective of Pharisees. Okay? But the tradition at the time in the temple was governed by the Sadducees. You go, what does this make a difference for at all? It's very important. Okay? It's very important because if God is giving a prophetic utterance about His plan for mankind, and we see that Jesus was the Paschal Lamb, we see He came into Jerusalem on Lamb Selection Day, He presented Himself at the temple to be inspected, He went to the cross on the day that the, the Lamb was sacrificed for the nation, he then went into the grave, and then he was raised again. Now, why is it important? It's important because we have to look at the timeline of how things progress, because it's very significant. Remember, nothing in Scripture is there accidentally. Uh, go ahead and go to the next one. <clears throat> Jumping into the New Testament, I'm going to show you why this is significant. Um, Paul is writing to the Corinthians. Go ahead and turn to Corinthians chapter, 1 Corinthians chapter 15 with me, if you would, please. Okay, in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, almost the entire chapter is given over to talking about the resurrection from the dead. Okay, Paul addresses first the resurrection of Christ, then he discusses our resurrection, then he talks about what the body will be like when it's resurrected. But I want to I pull out a, a passage in here. I would encourage you to understand this fully Take your time, read through this whole scripture, this whole passage. Okay? But I'm going to pull out one section. Verse 20 and following. Uh, Paul says, But in fact, Christ has been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. For as by a man came death, by a man has come also the resurrection from the dead. For as in Adam all die, so also in Christ shall all be made alive, but each in his own order. Christ the firstfruits, then at his coming, those who belong to Christ. Now do you notice a peculiar turn of phrase that Paul is using here? He's talking about the resurrection of the dead, but what is he correlating it to? First fruits. I think Paul is taking the Feast of First Fruits and he is applying it to Jesus Christ and to the bride, the body of Jesus Christ, the church. Not coincidentally, not accidentally. I think he's doing it with insight by the Holy Spirit and understanding. 
Why do I think this? Well, let's take a look at the last week of Jesus' life. We'll, we'll look at the week. Go ahead and go to the next one. And this is going to be hard to see because I'm trying to squish a lot of information in there. Um, oh, my moon disappeared. Okay, so the timeline going across the middle there, that's just the, the days. That's just time flowing along. If you'll notice on the left-hand side, I've got Nisan the 10th. Jesus enters Jerusalem. This is Lamb Selection Day. This is the beginning. Uh, Abib Nisan is the first month of the year for the Jews. Okay? So their year has just started. The 14th, Jesus comes in to Jerusalem. And they call it the triumphal entry. Uh, I don't think Jesus was feeling very triumphant because he was weeping as he came into the city and that's when he pronounced the, the prophecy that because they had rejected the Messiah that Jerusalem would be thrown down. They'd be encircled about by the enemy and ultimately Jerusalem and the temple would be destroyed. Okay? So Jesus comes in on the 10th of Nisan. And then on the 14th, Wednesday, so backing up the, the 10th would be what day? If, if the 14th is Wednesday, what would that make uh, the 10th? Sunday. Should be Saturday, right? Unless I miscounted. Okay, what's Saturday? The Sabbath. The Sabbath. <gasps> Jesus came into Jerusalem on the Sabbath. They're not supposed to be doing that. Thank you. Whoa. All right, where's the button? Oops, I think I turned it off. There it is. Okay, good. Um, so if Jesus came into Jerusalem on the Sabbath, how is he allowed to do that? They're not supposed to do any ordinary thing. The law says he's not supposed to be doing that. Well, the, the law also states that you could travel a Sabbath day's journey. And, and essentially that was the distance from uh, where you were to the synagogue. So that you could go and, and worship, or in this case, the temple. Jesus, keeping in mind, folks, Jesus did not violate a single law of the Hebrew Bible. Not only did he author it, he lived it out. So he comes into Jerusalem on the Lamb Selection Day. They're bringing the lambs in to be selected because the Passover has to be met. The tent fell on a Saturday. So Jesus comes in on Wednesday. Okay? And then... So he comes in Wednesday, the 14th. Jesus celebrates a Passover with his disciples. And then he's arrested. He goes to the garden. He's praying. Comes back, the disciples are sleeping. He wakes them up, he goes to pray. Comes back, the disciples are sleeping. He wakes them up, he goes to pray. He comes back, and they're sleeping again. He wakes them up, and then he's arrested. He's betrayed by Judas. Now... We know he went through the trial that night. We know the trial extended in to the next morning. Uh, at the end of it all, Pontius Pilate washes his hands of it. He says, I, I give to you, I am innocent of this man's blood. Isn't it amazing that a Gentile who had no understanding of all the prophecies in the word, the law, the prophets, understood better what was going on than the teachers of the law did? the religious leaders of the day, they, they were a, a self-fulfilling prophecy. Okay, So, he's arrested. The 15th Thursday, Jesus is tried and crucified. 9 a.m., he's buried. If you see right here, the 15th, that's the day that the Passover lamb was slain for the people of Israel. And it would have been done, guess what? 9 a.m. Okay. At sundown, now you can't really see it up here, but I've got moons marking sundown and suns marking the daytime. Okay, so at sundown, the Feast of Unleavened Bread begins. Now, going back to our dilemma about what Sabbath. Okay. If we look at the what Scripture says, it simply says the Sabbath, the, the day after the Sabbath. 
which to us would be Sunday, correct? Because Saturday is the Sabbath. Well, we see uh, unleavened bread has begun. Jesus dies. He's buried. Um, his body lies in the tomb during the first day of the Feast of Unleavened Bread. Uh, and then moving right here, Friday evening, Passover begins at sundown. Now, Jesus is still in the tomb, right? But Sabbath is Saturday, and on Sunday, first fruits begins. So, sundown on Saturday, first fruits begins. And then early in the morning, Scripture tells us that it was early in the morning, the stone shook, the soldiers fell, the stone was rolled away, not so Jesus could come out, but so that witnesses could go in. I don't think Jesus walked out when the, t the stone was rolled away. I think he was already out. But I think that, that's one of the marvelous things about the new body that he received and we will receive. You don't need to worry about doors. He just, whoop, he went out. He was already about doing what needed to be done. Why is this significant? People, this is an incredible picture. Jesus went to the cross. He, he was sacrificed the same, same time as the Paschal Lamb. Okay? He was without sin. Even the people that they hired to come in to rat him out could find nothing to accuse him of. Nothing. They couldn't even get their stories straight. What did they ultimately sacrifice? Why did he die? What was the ultimate thing? Because the high priest asked him a question. What did he ask him? Hmm? Are you God? Are you God? Yeah. Are you the promised one? Are you the anointed one? Are you the one that God said he was going to send to us? And Jesus said, I am. Yes, I am. I am he. Now, this should boggle your brain. This should confound you. Because this they have been waiting for since the prophecy given. You can even go way back to Genesis. But specifically to Abraham, and then through Abraham's line, and then through David, and then down. They have been looking for, they've been waiting for the promised one, the anointed one that would deliver them. And here he is, having performed wonders and miracles and signs and having understood the scripture at an age that confounded the elders in the temple. And here he is. He says, I'm it, baby. And what do they do? What does the priest do? Do you remember what he does when Jesus answers in the affirmative? I'm not going to do it. <laughs> Christy would be not happy with me. Neither would Lori because she'd have to sew him back on. He, he tore his clothes. And he said, this man is worthy of death because he says he is the one that God promised. Now, we look at that and go, how could they be so deceived? Well, we have the Spirit of God that helps us to see and understand those things. They did not. Okay? God looked down through eternity. He knew what their response would be. God was not taken off guard. He's not, dang it! I almost had it. It's moving according to His plan. Jesus is sacrificed. The Paschal Lamb is sacrificed. Jesus is entombed. On the third day, Scripture says on that Sunday, which would be first fruits. When Paul is speaking to the Corinthians that Jesus is the first fruits from the dead, he is saying very plainly, very clearly, Jesus is the fulfillment of the promise that God gave us in Leviticus 23. You guys think it's all about barley and bulls and sheep and goats and wine and flour did no that's an illustration it's a picture connect the dots now the first fruit indicates what well doesn't it indicate that there's going to be something that comes after because remember back in our our uh, first Corinthians 15 Jesus said in their order Jesus first 
And then who? Us. When Jesus comes back. So you say, well, wait a minute. There were other people in Scripture that were raised from the dead. Uh, Jairus' daughter and, and, and then, um, you know, Lazarus and, and, and the widow and, and, and her son. And, well, what about all of them? What's different between them and Jesus? They died again. Can you imagine that? You know, if I was Lazarus, I would have been ticked. <sighs> Could you imagine waking up wrapped with 70 some pounds of, of herbs and stuff and, and you wake up and you're in a dark place and, and you know, um, wow. The difference is Jesus will never die again. The difference is when we are resurrected, should God tarry in sending His Son back and we should go into the grave when we are resurrected, we will never taste death again. I tell you what, folks, I'm letting you know right now. If I die and one of you prays me back to life, I'm coming back swinging. <laughs> All right? So raise me from the other side of the room. Because I, uh uh. Man, when it's done, I want it to be done. I don't want to have to go through that multiple times. Okay? So why is this significant to us? Because as Christ is, we will be. He is the firstborn, the first fruits from the dead, resurrected into a newness of life that will never know decay, that will never diminish, and that's where we will go. That's what we will become. The mortal putting on the immortal. The perishable putting on the imperishable. This is the promise of God. Amen? Amen. Father, we bless you today. We thank you. Father, as we are in the season of pre preparation and celebrating the arrival of your Son. Father, I ask that you would not allow us to be distracted. All of the different things that are vying for our attention, all of the different noises, all of those things, Father, that would intrude, intervene, disrupt our connection with you. I ask, Father, that we would make a conscious decision each and every day, Father, each minute of the day, that no, I will set my heart, I will set my mind on you. I will not be distracted by the stuff that this world has to offer, but I will honor you. Father, I ask that you would renew in us that, that sense of wonder. Not because of the lights, not because of the tree, not because of the, the boxes wrapped underneath, but because of that baby wrapped, laid in the manger. And that, Father, we wouldn't stop there because we know that baby was predestined from before the foundation of the world. That baby was determined to go to the cross in our place. Help us, Father, to be a people of thanksgiving, of gratitude, of appreciation. And I ask God that as all those naysaying things come against us and life intervenes and the enemy seeks to disrupt and our own flesh rebels, Father, that we would press in hard after you. And we thank you, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen.